an innocent little girl, a brutal crime, three innocent people imprisoned, and a cruel serial killer. These are the elements of today's case, a case that shook a town and called into question the competence of the police and the effectiveness of the judicial system. In today's video, I will talk about the Janine Nicarico case. Janine Nicarico was born on July 7, 1972, in Naperville, a city located in the state of Illinois, United States. She was the daughter of Thomas and Patricia Nicarico and had two other sisters named Chris and Katie. Her mother worked as a secretary in the school's administration, while her father was an engineer who worked 64 kilometers away from home, specifically in Chicago. Those who knew little Janine said she was a charming girl with a captivating smile who loved going to school and reading books. She also adored animals, especially dogs and horses. On the morning of February 25, 1983, Janine woke up with a cold. She was 10 years old and in the fifth grade of elementary school. When her parents noticed that their daughter was feeling a bit ill, they decided it would be best to let her stay home to rest. At that time, and in that city, it was common for parents to leave their children alone at home. The area was considered very safe and quiet, as it had low crime rates. Janine's mother left an aspirin for her to take and went to work alongside her husband, while Janine's sisters went to school as usual. While at work, Patricia called her daughter three times in the morning to check on her. At lunchtime, she returned home to prepare food for her daughter. Upon arrival, Janine told her mother that a man from the gas company had come by to check the meter, and she had let him in. Patricia, a bit startled, admonished her daughter, saying that she should never let a stranger in. Patricia told her that if anyone knocked again, she should just call her, and she would come home immediately. After lunch, Patricia said goodbye to her daughter and returned to work. She later recounted that Janine hugged and kissed her while expressing her sadness about having to leave her alone. Patricia also reminded her daughter again not to let any strangers into the house no matter how much they insisted. About two hours later, when Janine's sisters returned from school, they were shocked to find the front door of their home broken open. Upon entering the house, they searched for Janine only to realize she wasn't there. They then went to a neighbor's house to ask for help. As soon as the girls told her what was happening, the neighbor called their mother, who returned home immediately. Inside the house, there was a glass of melted ice cream that Janine had left half-eaten and the beginning of a letter she was writing to her grandparents. The police were called, and at first they began working under the hypothesis of a botched robbery. Initially, a shoe print was found at the door, made at the time of the break-in, along with two more in the backyard. A sheet and a blanket were missing from one of the beds. Shortly after, the police began searches throughout the city but found no trace of the girl. Two days later, on February 27th, Janine's body was discovered in a park more than 1.8 miles from her home. She was dressed in a pink nightgown and had been discarded in a wooded area near a bike path. During the autopsy, it was determined that Janine had been the victim of rape and had then been severely beaten until she died. The crime and all the violence shocked the city of Naperville. The family of young Jeanine was devastated, and the community was enraged. An investigation led by local detective John Sam was quickly initiated. Shortly after, a reward of $10,000 was offered for anyone with information that could lead to the person responsible for the crime. After this reward was announced, the police received numerous anonymous calls pointing to supposed individuals involved in the crime. The police investigated all the names provided, but none led to anything concrete, and they were gradually dismissed one by one, until someone mentioned the name Alex Hernandez. At the time, Alex Hernandez was 21 years old and came from a very humble background. He lived on the streets of Aurora, a city just a few miles from Naperville. People who knew him described him as someone with limited intelligence and confused ideas. Alex had not completed his education and was unemployed. He had also been arrested for minor offenses, such as theft and disturbing the peace. Detective John Sam decided to track down Alex to ask him some questions about the crime. In his testimony, Alex claimed that a few days earlier, he had been drinking with other men when one of them admitted to being responsible for the crime that victimized Janine. Alex stated that at the time he was sitting in a car with three other men, one named Stephen, another named Ricky, and a third whose name he couldn't remember. Alex said it was Ricky who confessed to the crime. The police decided to verify this information, even though they believed it was merely a story fabricated by Alex. 
They then went after the men mentioned in his story. They searched for the supposed Ricky, but never found anyone matching the description given by Alex. Stephen and the other man, however, were located by the detectives. Stephen Buckley was a 23-year-old man, while the other man was 19-year-old Rolando Cruz. Both were also from the city of Aurora and were homeless. Stephen and Rolando claimed they knew nothing about the crime and had never drunk with Alex, as he had reported. They acknowledged knowing Alex but denied ever having met him, stating that he was not a friend of theirs. The detective then showed a photo of the type of boot whose imprint had been found on the door of Janine's house, which had been broken into. The detective asked if they knew anyone who wore that type of boot, and Stephen himself said he had a similar boot. At no point did Stephen show any signs of nervousness or any behavior indicating that he was hiding something. On the contrary, he answered all the detective's questions without any issues, and even cooperated with the authorities by handing over his boots for forensic examination. In the initial analysis conducted on the boots, the police lab's identification specialist stated that they were not compatible with those from the crime. However, later on, the same specialist would reverse his statement and say that the boots could indeed be the same ones used in the crime. Since Stephen and Alex were the closest the police had come to the possible perpetrator, they decided to investigate both men more thoroughly to see what they could find. Both Stephen and Alex were called in for questioning several times, but even so, the police could not extract any relevant information for the case. It was then that the detectives came up with a strategy to set a kind of trap for Alex in an attempt to get him to talk. The police placed Alex in a room with another man who pretended to be the one responsible for Janine's crime. Before this, the detectives told Alex that if he could get that man to confess to the crime, he would receive the $10,000 reward. The police hoped that this would lead Alex to divulge information indicating that he could be responsible for the crime. The entire conversation between Alex and the man pretending to be the criminal was monitored from outside the room by other officers. At one point in the conversation, Alex ended up boasting about having been at the crime scene. He stated that other men had participated in the crime and that his role was to hold the girl so she wouldn't escape. Shortly after this statement, Alex Hernandez was arrested. However, one of the detectives had the impression that Alex was just making up stories to persuade the other man and earn the reward. The detective then drove with the young man through the neighborhood where Janine's house was located. He believed that if Alex had truly participated in the crime, he would be able to easily identify either the victim's house or the crime scene. However, Alex was unable to accurately identify either location. According to the detective, Alex pointed to several houses claiming they were Janine's house, but he did not get it right even once. With this, the detective became convinced that Alex had no connection to the crime and decided to turn his attention to Stephen. The police interrogated Stephen for over six hours, hoping to extract any information indicating that he was responsible for the crime. However, Stephen maintained his initial version throughout, leading the detectives to also believe that he was not responsible for the crime. At one point during the interrogation, the man allegedly said that they could arrest him or even take his life, but he would never confess to a crime he did not commit. The police also pursued Rolando Cruz and offered him the $10,000 reward for any information that could help solve the case. Rolando claimed to have some information and, like Stephen and Alex, he was also taken in for questioning, but the information he had was not relevant. A few days later, Stephen, Alex, and Rolando were temporarily arrested by the police. Although authorities had no physical evidence linking them to the crime, they were the closest the police had come to solving the case so they decided to keep them detained until the investigations were concluded. For 10 months, authorities tried to gather enough evidence to prove that the three men were guilty of the crime. Aside from the impression and footprint of the criminal's boot found at the crime scene, there was no physical evidence connecting any of the three men to the crime. Even so, since the crime had gained significant attention throughout the region, during the 10-month investigation into the three men, Several people came forward willing to testify, claiming they heard from one of the accused that he was responsible for the crime. Tom Knight, the prosecutor of the case at the time, believed that the three men had broken into the victim's home to commit a robbery. However, once they broke down the front door, they encountered Janine inside the house and decided to take the girl with them. John Sam, one of the detectives responsible for the case, was not convinced that this was what actually happened. 
Throughout 1984, while the prosecutors and defense attorneys prepared for the trial, John Sam continued to investigate the case. He believed that the three men were innocent and did not want them to pay for a crime they did not commit. He checked various anonymous tips and interrogated new suspects. The detective even faced a complaint from one of the witnesses in the case who felt uncomfortable with his persistent questioning. John believed that this witness was not being very honest in her statements, which is why he decided to question her more than once. By doing so, she felt bothered and reported him to the police department. For the detective, there were no reasons for those three men to have committed the crime. He said he could not imagine three men capturing and forcing a girl to have relations randomly without any of them being bothered by it. Moreover, the detective emphasized that none of the three were willing to provide evidence against the others, even knowing that it would spare them from the death penalty. In most cases like this, accomplices usually turn on each other to avoid a harsher conviction. But it was not only this that convinced John of the innocence of the three accused. He also pointed out the flaws in the prosecutor's work as one of the reasons. According to him, Tom Knight was a great prosecutor, but he allowed himself to be overly guided by emotions. He would understandably be affected by the brutal crime against a little girl, but this led him to seek out culprits at all costs, even if it meant imprisoning the innocent. Shortly before the trial, John Sam resigned from his position at the police department and focused solely on assisting with the case. He even offered to be a defense witness. Since none of the young men in custody could afford a lawyer, public defenders were assigned to represent them. One of these lawyers, Tim Gabrielson, stated that he entered the case believing they were truly guilty and that he would try to negotiate a plea deal with the prosecution. However, after reading through all the case files, it became clear to him that the prosecution had little evidence for the charges. Tim recalls waiting for some explosive proof that would demonstrate the young men's guilt, but that evidence never materialized. For him, there was no doubt that the prosecution had failed to prove the case and was merely seeking to convict someone. On March 8, 1984, Rolando, Alex, and Steve were indicted for the crime against Jeanine Nicarico. The trial of the three young men began in February 1985. The evidence presented by the prosecution was circumstantial, primarily focusing on the footprint found at the door. During the trial, an anthropologist from the University of North Carolina was called as an expert witness to prove that the footprint truly belonged to one of the accused. According to the prosecution, Rolando had a kind of vision that he shared with the detectives, which closely resembled how the crime actually occurred. However, this alleged statement was not documented by the detectives until the trial, raising suspicions about its validity. One of the responsible detectives stated that he did not record it earlier because the prosecutor told him it was unnecessary. The trial was much more based on the emotions involved than on the facts of the crime. The prosecutor showed numerous photos of the victim to the jurors, highlighting the family's pain as motivation for their decision. At times, due to the graphic images, the jurors themselves became emotional while watching the sessions. The witnesses were also a strong point for the prosecution. Among them were a prison guard and a lieutenant who claimed to have overheard the young men discussing the crime from inside their cell. Additionally, a cousin of Alex testified that the young man had confessed to the crime. However, after the trial, the man recanted his statement, saying he had been coerced by the prosecutors to testify. The defense attorneys attacked the convictions on several fronts, such as the weakness of the evidence, questionable police methods, and the judge's refusal to offer individual trials for each of the accused. According to them, judging the three at the same time was unfair, as a testimony against just one, for example, would end up serving as evidence against all. Detective John Sam went to court in an attempt to testify in favor of the accused, but was limited to recounting the facts of the crime, as the judge prohibited him from giving his opinion on the case. After several days of trial, the jury was unable to reach a verdict regarding Stephen, resulting in his acquittal and release from prison. Alex and Rolando, on the other hand, were found guilty of the crime against Janine. The jury did not necessarily vote for the death penalty against the two young men, but the presiding judge imposed that sentence. According to one of the jurors, they were not completely convinced of the guilt of those men. For him, the death penalty should only be applied when there is no doubt, which was not the case. Nevertheless, Alex and Rolando were sentenced to death. A few months after the trial, on June 2, 1985, the police discovered the body of Melissa Ackerman, a seven-year-old girl. 
The body was buried in a drainage ditch a few miles from where Janine's body had been found. Melissa had also been kidnapped and raped, just like Janine. According to reports, Melissa was riding her bike with a friend near a park when a man driving nearby saw her, parked, and attacked her while her friend managed to escape. The main suspect in the crime was Brian Dugan, a 29-year-old man. Brian had previously been arrested for various crimes of the same nature, and just days before Melissa's body was found, was arrested again on charges of murdering a 27-year-old nurse named Donna Schnorr. Brian Dugan quickly confessed to the crimes against Donna and Melissa to his public defender, but that wasn't all. He also claimed to be responsible for another case, the case of Janine Nicarico. According to his confession, Brian was walking down the street when he decided to knock on Janine's door, asking to borrow a screwdriver. The girl replied that she couldn't open the door for strangers. The man then forced the door open, grabbed the girl, and tied her up with a bedsheet, using the same fabric to wipe his fingerprints from the doorknob. According to Brian, after seeing Janine alone at home through the window, he couldn't resist, which became his motivation to commit the crime. After taking Janine, he said he went out to park his car closer to the house and to get some duct tape. On his return, he blindfolded the girl, used the tape to reinforce the bindings, and took her to his car. Brian then drove to the park where the body was found days later. He stated that it was in his car that he raped the girl. Later, with Janine still alive, he promised her that he would take her back home so she would stop crying. They then left the vehicle and while she walked ahead, he struck her in the back of the neck with a wrench. The girl fell to the ground and the man continued to hit her until she was lifeless. Afterward, he dragged Janine's body and threw it near some bushes. Next, he drove away but ended up taking the wrong direction and got the car stuck in the mud on a dead-end road. At that moment, two men working at a toll booth helped him, pulling the car out of the mud and giving him directions to the correct route. These two men were later identified by the police. They confirmed that they had helped a white man driving a green car on the afternoon of the crime, the same color as Brian's car. After this confession, several pieces of evidence confirmed Brian's version. The police discovered that the tires of his car matched the tracks left at the scene where Janine's body was found. Additionally, the man's boss confirmed that he had not gone to work that day. Finally, it was proven that he owned shoes that matched the footprint left at the victim's door. After hearing Brian's testimony, George Muller, the man's defense attorney, contacted the lawyers representing the young men convicted of the crime against Janine, as well as the prosecution, to inform them about the confession. The prosecutors, however, were skeptical and said the man was probably just adding to the list of confessed crimes to reduce his sentence, as judges tend to lessen prison time for each crime confessed. With this theory in mind, Brian's defense attorney and some prosecutors asked him questions about details of the case that had not been made public. He was able to answer all of them, indicating that he was indeed involved in the crime. This information was passed on to the prosecutors in Jeanine's case, who said they would contact him later but never did. Even after securing a sentence reduction deal due to his confessions, Brian continued to assert that he was responsible for Janine's murder, showing that it wasn't an attempt to manipulate the justice system. The man even told a detective specific details about the crime, which were later confirmed by the investigators on the case. These details would only have been known to the police who worked on the case and the perpetrator himself. The toll booth witness's description also pointed to Brian, as they described a white man in his late 20s, a description that fit Brian perfectly, but not Rolando and Alex, who had dark skin and were only 19 and 21 years old at the time. Brian easily guided the detectives to the victim's house and the location where her body was found. Additionally, his criminal record included crimes in which he tied his victims with bedsheets, as well as some home invasions, similar to what happened with Janine. The man was even hypnotized and subjected to a polygraph test to determine if he was telling the truth. Both confirmed that he was being sincere. Brian, however, made some inaccuracies in his statements, such as getting the side of the stairs wrong in the victim's house and claiming he left the body face up when it was actually found face down. The police, however, noted that the man might have confused details due to the number of crimes he had committed. The prosecutors in Janine's case, however, ignored the evidence against Brian Dugan and stuck to the version that Alex and Rolando were the real culprits. On January 19, 1988, the United States Supreme Court granted the defense's request 
and ruled that the judge had erred by not allowing individual trials, overturning the convictions. As a result, a new trial was required. Rolando's second trial took place two years later, on January 11, 1990. His defense used Brian Dugan's confession and all the evidence against him, trying to prove that Brian was the true culprit. The prosecution, on the other hand, argued that even if Brian was responsible, Rolando and Alex were his accomplices and had participated in the crime. In court, it was said that Rolando's cousin had seen him with Brian, but she denied this information when called to testify. Without direct testimony from Brian, the defense turned to the state police commander who had led the investigation into Brian. The plan was for him to recount Brian's confession in detail, but the prosecution objected and the judge agreed, preventing the jury from hearing this information. According to the prosecution, the footprints found outside Janine's house proved that not just one, but several people were involved in the crime. However, forensic experts later confirmed that these extra footprints belonged to a woman, possibly random people who had passed by the scene. On February 1, 1990, Rolando was once again found guilty of the crime and sentenced to death. Alex's second trial in 1990 ended in a hung jury. A third trial was held, and in May 1991, he was again found guilty of the crime and sentenced to 80 years in prison. After these new convictions, further evidence emerged in the case. Scientific analysis of hair samples taken from the blindfold on Jeanine's eyes showed a high compatibility with Brian's hair, while no similarities were found with Alex's or Rolando's hair. In addition, DNA tests from blood samples of Brian, Rolando, Alex, and Stephen were released. The results were negative for Alex and Stephen, inconclusive for Rolando, and a positive match for Brian. In 1994, with improved technology, new DNA tests were conducted, definitively excluding Alex and Rolando from the crime. The new tests identified male fluid samples at the crime scene, and the results pointed to Brian Dugan. As the evidence emerged, the defense for the two men filed new appeals, requesting a review of the case. In May 1993, the Supreme Court agreed to review Rolando's case and scheduled a new trial for him. On January 30, 1995, the Illinois State Court of Appeals, considering the DNA tests, overturned Alex's conviction, exonerating him and releasing him from prison. That same year, Rolando had his third trial and was acquitted after a police lieutenant testified, presenting genetic tests that cleared the young men. Patricia Nicarico, Jeanine's mother, became very emotional in her interviews about the case, alternating between smiles and tears as she recalled moments with her daughter. She mentioned that everything seemed terrifying, and it was hard for her to believe her daughter was really gone. The case not only shocked the public, but also attracted significant attention as such violent crimes were rare in that region. The fact that many working mothers left their children home alone raised concerns and fears about the issue. Both Janine's family and the townspeople criticized the investigations and trials, which proved to be lengthy. Margaret Price, the mayor of Naperville at the time, expressed that everyone longed for the case to be resolved and did not foresee how long it would take, considering the devastating delay. Former detective John Sam reported that he was considered a traitor by many people for siding with the accused. He explained that by claiming these men were innocent, he was treated as though he was fighting to let the crime go unpunished. To Janine's family, Brian was lying about his guilt. In April 1987, the girl's parents held a press conference contesting Brian's account and reaffirming their belief that Alex and Rolando were responsible for the crime. They cited several inconsistencies in Brian's statements and expressed the conviction that someone had provided him with information to falsely take responsibility. By 1996, given the case's trajectory, the state indicted seven police officers, three prosecutors, and four detectives, accusing them of lying and fabricating evidence against Rolando. According to the prosecution, the officials had conspired to convict him despite being aware of the defense's evidence. After several legal proceedings in June 1999, all were acquitted of the charges. Meanwhile, Alex, Rolando, and Stephen filed a civil lawsuit for wrongful accusation against the police and prosecution. They received a $3.5 million settlement in September 2000. In 2002, then-Governor George Ryan granted a public pardon to Rolando, and in 2003 he imposed a moratorium on execution in the state, resulting in the release of 167 people from death row. 
In 2005, Brian Dugan was indicted for the crimes against Janine. His trial took place in 2009, where he pleaded guilty, confirming his earlier confession. At that time, he was already serving life sentences for two other convictions. On November 11, 2009, after about 10 hours of deliberations over two days, the jury sentenced Brian Dugan to death for the crime against Janine committed 26 years earlier. However, the sentence was commuted to life in prison after Illinois passed a law in 2011 abolishing the death penalty. Following the new evidence, Patricia, Janine's mother, began to speak less about the case. Before Brian's trial, she expressed hope that she might finally get some truth and justice for her daughter. In 2010, Janine Nicarico's name was given to a children's center in DuPage in her honor. The center is responsible for investigating serious cases of violence against minors and working with those who witness violent crimes. This was the case of Janine Nicarico, a little girl who became the victim of a brutal crime and a national symbol of the flaws in the justice system and the death penalty.